I saw a talk that you gave, I think it's a, in a YouTube video from maybe 10 or 13 years ago, uh, about the fractional reserve, uh, the fractional reserve system. And the example that you gave got me thinking so much about it, um, where you said you can't have more titles to cars than there are cars and how the monetary system is not designed around what I think, uh, most people would call the idea of sovereign money where you can't just create more of it like gold or silver or something like that. Or if you do create more of it, it's through work, you know, mining something out of the ground or, uh, working to create a, uh, you know, barrels of oil or, you know, something, something to that effect. Yeah. You just can't create it out of the thin air. So it, it, um, seems like it has a lot of unintended consequences where it makes borrowing seem more productive than being productive. Well, there's nothing wrong with borrowing. No, uh, just in a in a um, in a fractional reserve system, borrowing becomes in some ways inflationary because the fact that you're borrowing money and then you spend it, that person then goes and deposits it, which then well, the bank can lend out ten times that new deposit, right? It's not really the borrowing that we should focus on that is the problem. The problem is the fractional reserve banking. If there were no fractional reserve banking. And, and you're a bank, and I've got money that I don't know what to do with, so I deposit 10 bucks in your bank, and then you uh, lend it, and it's a time deposit, not a demand deposit, and now you lend out uh, whatever it is of that 10 bucks, uh, that's fine. Uh, you were just an intermediary because I didn't know the guy who needed to borrow the money, and you take a little uh, percentage of uh, your profit because, uh, for being the uh, mediator or the middleman or whatever it is, uh, th that's fine. Uh, the problem is when there's fractional reserve banking and I uh, I, I deposit a hundred dollars in your bank and and then you uh, you have your fraction is say ten percent. So you keep um, uh, um, ten ten dollars and you lend out ninety and you give that guy a demand deposit too. Uh, in other words, when I deposited that hundred dollars in your bank, you gave me a demand deposit and now I can come and get that hundred whenever I want. And now you go and lend, you dirty rat, you, <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding, of course, uh, you go and you lend 90 to this other guy, and you give him the band deposit, you now have instantaneous debts of 190, and you've only got $10 in your bank uh, if, he, uh, if he takes his money out. So you're engaging in fraud uh, because your instantaneous liabilities are greater than your instantaneous assets. Uh, uh, you know, if it's a time deposit, then that, that's okay, as long as the timing is, is right. But now there's $190 worth of money where there used to be 100 And it's all due to you, you fraction reserve banker, you. That was a curse word against you. <laughs> you know, I'm just being silly. I, I'm not blaming you for anything. Well, and then some people will say, but as long as people agree to that, and they know that that's how money works, that it doesn't you know, the dollar doesn't represent anything real. It's not backed by anything real. And so in that sense, by using the dollar, you're, you're saying that you agree to, you know, you understand that that's how it works. Except my experience is that not very many people know or would consider fractional reserve banking a kind of fraud. Well, virtually nobody knows about it. Either. They've taken um, surveys of people. Can you name your senator? Uh, can you name one member of the uh, Supreme Court? Uh, the, the president, usually everybody knows who the president is, but maybe not even the vice president. There's a lot of low information voters out there. Uh, so there's a lot of people and I'm not blaming them. You know, why should they know this stuff? Uh, they're interested in um, engineering or, or pizza or whatever. Uh, not everybody should be interested in what you and I are interested in. So the idea that everyone knows about this is just um, silly. Uh, I get uh, freshman students who are pretty bright in um, economics. They don't know this stuff. But even suppose, arguendo, that people knew about it, it's still fraud. Uh, uh, it, it's um, it, even, I mean, fraud doesn't have to mean that you, you don't know about it. You could be engaging in, um, I don't know, uh, some sort of game or whatever. So I, I reject that. I mean, that's a good argument against the criticism of fractional reserve banking, but I, I reject it. 
Yeah, it's the same way. Like, why should we expect everybody to be experts in monetary policy? I go to the doctor. I'm the reason I'm paying him is because I would rather him be it because I want to focus on my own things. Right. You don't know what's wrong with your elbow and you go to him and and he probably doesn't know much about monetary theory. We have specialization and division of labor. So you don't have to be really stupid. I mean, I'm sure your doctor is a bright guy. He couldn't have gotten out of medical. Well, he could have if there was affirmative action. But forgetting about that, uh, he's probably a bright guy, but just not interested. I mean, Einstein was um, a great physicist. He was also a socialist. And we have to acknowledge that he's a bright guy. Uh, that's an understatement of the century. But he's uh, also a socialist, which uh, I don't think is the brightest uh, uh, thing on the block. It's like listening to actors give their political opinions, like, you know, stick to your area of expertise, please. I trust you. You do a great job there. But just because you're an expert there doesn't make you an expert everywhere. Well, the, we have free speech. They should be allowed to, you know, mouth off about whatever they want. But we have to take it not with a grain of salt, but with a bucket of salt. It's difficult to do that. Um, <laughs> the difficult thing for me is that it seems like fraud is winning by and large you know if somebody wanted to open up a bank where they practiced full reserve banking they couldn't make it because everybody else is able to get ahead because they're committing fraud yeah and if you engaged in in 100 percent banking and you started calling in the loans of uh, fraction reserve bankers you get in trouble for i don't know i mean th there are now laws against um fomenting a bank run See, like the, the fraction. But what if it's true? What if the bank needs to go out of business? <laughs> well, the, the, the laws against that. I mean, uh, it's sort of like libel and slander, but it's a special uh, law against uh, fomenting, um, uh, undermining a bank. It's a, a, a particularly egregious crime. So if I held out a sign saying uh, this bank is a fraud and and go get your money now before, you know, I I could go to jail for that, and. Um, and actually, what would happen is that the um, the Fed would just create a lot more money <laughs> uh, right off the spot and give it to them, and there'd be plenty of money for them. That, namely, they would support that. So I, I think the whole thing is rotten, or what do they say, rotten in Denmark? I don't know why you pick on Denmark, but uh, something is rotten here, and, and it, it should be changed. So if you can't just do it overnight, I mean, I think even most libertarians would probably say, yeah, you, you can't do it overnight. You'd, you'd break too many things, be more productive to do it gradually. How would it be done gradually? How would we gradually, you know, obviously there's the, you know, talking, teaching people about it and letting people know. And so at least they're on the lookout for an alternative if, and they'd be in favor of it if they were to see it. But most people, if, if some solution popped up, they wouldn't. There's no problem. So why would they be on the lookout for a solution? Well, what we're doing right now is one millionth of a percent of curing it. Uh, namely, we're promoting um, good economics about the situation. But, you know, it's interesting uh, about doing things gradually. Like, suppose we're back in 1850 and we have the power to end slavery somehow. and But we don't end it we, because that would be too disruptive. We uh, just uh, free 10% of all the slaves uh, for the next 10 years. Well, you know, if we could have ended slavery in 1850, and instead we ended all in 1860, we're a little guilty of keeping slavery around for, uh, well, there are no positive obligations, but if we're the government, you know, we, we really should have got rid of slavery uh, in one fell swoop uh, right then and there, and we shouldn't be getting rid of evil uh, gradually. If if we have the power to get rid of evil, we should get rid of evil, period. Murray Rothbard once said, if there was a button here on the podium and I could press the button, um, I would uh, end slavery or whatever it was that uh, Murray was talking about. Um, I mean, there is this argument that it would be disruptive. Well, it would be disruptive if you ended all slavery. You know, where would they go and, you know, problem and where would the, how would the cotton get picked and there are the problems. But I think from a deontological point of view, it's obligatory to end evil whenever you can and not worry about, well, yes, there'll be um, uh, difficulties and complexities. Uh, you just sort of end it. 
Well, and I feel like a lot of that type of stuff, the collateral damage is for the free market for entrepreneurs and people to figure out how to solve those problems. Right. You let them be creative and come up with the solutions, but they can't act on complete information unless you do a full, um, unless you have the will to go all the way. Right. And, and the, the um, blame or the responsibility for the chaos is not with us who are eliminating slavery or fraction. Not that I'm equating slavery and fractional reserve banking. I'm only equating them in the sense that we want to get rid of both. Obviously, slavery is a, a horrendous, uh, despicable thing. And whereas fractional reserve banking is not deserved to be mentioned even in, in the same sentence. But um, uh, the idea here is that if there's chaos, and, and they might well be, then the fault of the chaos is not on us for getting rid of the evil. It's rather on them for putting the evil in in the first place that we had to get rid of in one fell swoop. I'm a big fan of taking responsibility, even when it's not my problem, because like it or not, it affects me. It affects everybody. So, you know, how is there any way that you've thought? How do you take personal responsibility? And at least as far as I'm concerned, how, how do I go about obviously not committing fraud in ways that I might not even be aware of before I knew what the monetary policy was like. Well, you know, there, there is the problem. Well, if you don't like fractional reserve banking, don't use money. That might be an objection. Um, and then we might say, well, if you don't like uh, government highways, don't use the highway. Uh, if you don't like uh, government parks, don't use the park. Well, you know, the government is so pervasive, it's hard to not use something of government. Uh, like I, right now, I work at a private university, um, a Loyola University in New Orleans, but I previously worked at a public university, University of Central Arkansas, and uh, uh, Stony Brook, SUNY, uh, we're uh, Rutgers with public universities. So you might say, well, I'm being hypocritical because I'm against public education, and yet I'm, what am I doing being a professor there? Or I was a student uh, at Brooklyn College, which was a, a, a public college. And what I would say is, um, well, on a practical ground, it's hard to avoid the government. You, you just go out of your house and you're on the public sidewalks. You know, should you not walk on the public sidewalks? Should you be a hermit? You're occupying uh, you federal airspace just by being outdoors. Right. Should you not, um, uh, I don't know, um, get on an airplane because the airplanes are regulated? Uh, should you not eat food because the government subsidizes food, that namely you die? Well, look, libertarianism is not a suicide pact. Uh, I, I don't think we have to um, eschew uh, any of the uh, government services. From an anarcho-capitalist point of view, the government is a criminal gang. And when we uh, go into a public library and borrow a book or something, um, uh, we are just, um, what's the word, doing bad to an evil institution. Namely, we're, we're hurting an evil institution. So it's virtuous that we go out on the public street. Uh, in one of my books, um, Defending the Undefendable, I favored littering. Why littering? Because in the, um, you know, you go to a, a, a ballpark um, and you're allowed to put peanut shells down uh, on, on below you. And you go to a, a movie theater, you're allowed to, popcorn gets off on the floor, they sweep it up. Uh, whereas with the government, they say it's against the law. So what I'm saying is that if you litter, what you're really doing is striking the blow against evil. So I'm defending um, litter. Well, if I can defend litter, I can certainly defend uh, going as a student to a public university or taking money from the government as a professor in a public university. Namely, you're weakening the government by taking money away from it. So it's a virtuous thing. It's not something that we have to eschew. Did I knock your socks off with that? No, no. I've thought about that before because I remember, I remember reading some of your thoughts to that effect. There is something that doesn't sit right with me about going, um, in one sense, full-blown individualistic, because everybody's actions do affect everybody else's. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the Bible with the, the idea of gleaning. You know, if you if you grow crops, then you're supposed to leave some on the edges for the poor to come and and pick some. So in that sense, um, you know, call it me aligning with socialism on one small point. But, you know, I think the idea is that there is supposed to be a basic level where people bounce 
and they can't sink below that. Now it's my idea of it is a lot lower than, than most people would think of, you know, where people should bounce, but, um, you're owed, uh, clothes to sleep in, uh, and you're owed, uh, the ability to work if you're able in order to not die. So if you want to go work in somebody's field to, to get food to eat so that you don't die, I think if somebody has a field and they've stripped it completely bare, then I would say that somebody's supposed to be able to bounce there. But that's a lot lower than most socialists would go. They must they would either argue for universal basic income or they would argue for minimum wage or welfare or something like that, which I would I'm arguing for much much lower, but I think there is supposed to be a point where, you know, if you're if you're growing crops you're supposed to let people come and work in your field so that they can eat to live. If they're at that bare level of, you know, I'm going to starve in a month if I can't go to work. Well, look, if I were the God of the poor people and I was benevolent, I'm a benevolent dictator and I want what's best for the poor people. And I have two choices. One is your system of very, very minimal welfare. If I can put words in your mouth, or uh, pure laissez-faire capitalism and no obligation to give any charity, whether it's gleaning or tithing or anything. Where do you think the poor would be better off? Well, I think the poor would be better off in a pure capitalist society with no requirements for charity at all. No requirements. People are free to give charity, of course. But uh, I think that if you compel people to uh, leave a little bit of their fields for gleaning, and if you compel people to not tie the 10%, but at one-tenth of 1%, uh, very, very little, I think, I think that it would be worse for the poor. I think the poor would be better off without that. Uh, so, But this is an empirical issue, but it's a horse race. In other words, you can't say, well, you're full of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, given that you're uh, an intelligent and knowledgeable and a person who's a libertarian, you, you can't reject this out of hand and say, well, that, that's just obviously nonsense. Uh, you uh, realize that it, I might be right, that maybe laissez-faire would be better, full laissez-faire, with charity allowed but not required. And uh, the problem is right now there are poor people starving in, I don't know where, um, uh, Africa somewhere. And you, you dirty rat, I'm, I don't know why I keep calling you a dirty rat, but you're just sitting there and you've got earphones and you've got um, a, a nice shirt and, and you've got um, uh, the wherewithal to have this interview. You should be giving them money, even though you don't know of them. You know, and, and if you started spending your time worrying about people in Africa or somewhere that we don't even know about, uh, you'd be less productive. And if you're less productive, then the poor people, paradoxically, will be worse off. Uh, so I, I think just on pragmatic grounds, uh, the poor will be better off without any compulsion. Now, on deontological grounds, this violates the non-aggression principle that, or, or the, um, the libertarian objection to positive rights or positive obligations. There are no positive obligations. The only obligation we all have is to keep our midst to ourselves and not grab other people or their property or, or violate rights in any way. And once you start letting the cloven hoof of government in under the, the tent, once you start compromising with the basic libertarian view of no positive obligations, uh, you know, why should it only be one tenth of one percent of uh, GDP uh, that uh, that you have to pay? Why, why not two tenths of one percent? And now we're off onto the races. I mean, I think the first uh, income tax in 1913 or 1911, somewhere in there, was like one percent, <laughs> and now now the government gets roughly 50 percent of the GDP give or take with all the taxes. So it's creeping. And, and I, I want to stop it right off at, at the outset on the basis of principle. But I appreciate your point. I mean, we're, we're both filled with the milk of human kindness. We don't like suffering. We don't, we don't like poor. So we're just having an argument not over the goal, 
which is to help the poor, but over what's the best means. And I think the best means of helping the poor is pure libertarianism with no compulsion, no positive obligation, no rights or anything. And the reason people are not working is because of government interference. Uh, there's unions, there's minimum wage, the, the, the taxes. Uh, the, whenever there's a problem, it's usually the government's fault. And, and you mentioned, you know, unemployment and poverty. Well, unemployment and poverty are caused by government. Very true. And I think it's also important to mention, you know, we're getting a little bit outside of the realm we keep getting back to, of, you know, defining libertarianism was libertarianism, which is, should you be able to force people to do it? And it's from a humanistic standpoint, I would agree with you. From a religious standpoint, I have to disagree, but it's in one sense, it, practically speaking, it's not going to look any different. Because when I say that the, you know, people should allow are required to allow gleaning in fields, I also don't necessarily think that there's supposed to be an earthly government that enforces or punishes people if they don't. I believe God will take care of it, and you reap what you sow kind of thing, to where if you refuse to help poor people, well, if you ever become poor, you know, I just hope that they don't treat you the same way that they that you were treating them. So, in that sense, you know, should people uh, allow gleaning? Yes, I would say so morally. But as far as the government is concerned, and as far as libertarian only goes to what should the role of government be, I would say strictly a libertarianism in that sense, there should be no requirement to allow to give to the poor or to allow them to glean or to make sure that they they bounce at a certain level. Well, libertarian is only concerned with law. We're not concerned with morality. I mean, there are a lot of things that are many people consider immoral, but you, you shouldn't be put in, in jail for it. For example, pornography or prostitution or uh, gambling or drugging or uh, victimless crimes. A lot of people, and I go along with uh, many of them on this, I would think that all that stuff is immoral. But the, for libertarianism, that's uh, irrelevant. The libertarian, the libertarian asks only one question, namely, what's the proper use of violence? And we say, yes, the, the government or somebody should stop murder and rape and theft and kidnapping and slavery and et cetera, because that's a violation. But these victimless crimes are only immoral and they shouldn't be illegal. And, and this is a hard um, distinction to draw for a lot of people. They conflate morality and legality and they say, well, the law should compel everyone to be moral. And we libertarians say, no, 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 the law should not compel everyone to be moral. You can be immoral. Look, homosexuality uh, in many religions is considered immoral. And I would say anything between consenting adults. And, you know, in some countries, if you're gay, they'll throw you off the top of the building. They'll kill you just for uh, having uh, intercourse with another man or a woman with a woman. Uh, I think that's despicable. Uh, but but I'm I'm straight. I'm I'm a hetero. I'm on the hetero team, and the idea of homosexuality is sort of off-putting for me. And I can emphasize that a lot of people would think it's immoral, but those people have a right uh, to be immoral if it is immoral. And I'm not an expert in morality. I hope I'm an expert in libertarian theory, but I, I so I I, I think. Maybe it is immoral. I don't know. A lot of people think uh, homosexuality is immoral, but that doesn't mean that we should put them in jail for that. I just watched this movie, this wonderful movie. Um, uh, it was the British movie where the British um, broke the Nazi code, uh, and it was done by a gay guy. He was the first guy, the Turing, Alan Turing, was the first guy to ever create a computer. And he created this computer uh, to get the Nazi uh, code. And you know what those bastards the British government did to him after the war? They made him take drugs, which, and then he committed suicide. I mean, he was one of the heroes of the war, and he was gay, and, and they were vicious to him. And I, uh, uh, as a libertarian, uh, protest against that. Yeah, it's so interesting, too. I think the most people use the diff distinction between like legality and morality the same way you do. And I've been learning recently that as far as the West goes, that's sort of been the historical way to look at it. But as far as the Bible goes in, in more Eastern countries, the 
the word in the Bible for law literally means uh, instruction. And it does conflate morality and, and legality. It doesn't make a distinction necessarily. Homosexuality being one of those things on the on the legality side where I think it should be against the law to, to engage in certain types of deviant sexual behavior. Um, the same way adultery. Um, it's, it's a little bit more sticky than adultery because adultery, there's, there's been a contract signed. You've agreed to not do these things. So I understand why it can be a little bit more difficult to accept the homosexuality thing because there's no contract in place saying that you wouldn't do that. So by what right can you punish somebody? It's a, it's a really interesting discussion that's a little bit off topic. Um, but the, the distinction between morality and legality, like in the Bible, it'll go between you know, the reason that you don't make your daughter a prostitute is because it's going to cause a whole lot more people to fall into prostitution, which is also bad. Is that a legal requirement for the government to act? Or is it's more just a instruction? If you do this, this is the path that it's going to lead down. Nobody's going to enforce that um, other than God. But also, you know, how can you see the hand of God moving? For a lot of people, you, you really can't unless you know what to look for. Well, look, I have a daughter. I wouldn't want her to be a prostitute, and she's not a prostitute. She's a professor. Uh, but if she were a prostitute, I wouldn't want her to be put in jail for that. Me neither. So there's uh, there's distinctions. There's a lot of other morality things I can't just be like, oh, yeah, the way everybody thinks about, you know, what Christians think about is is wrong. And a lot on a lot of things, I agree. I think Christians are not careful enough with how they use the Bible and it's led to a lot of an unfortunate uh, lack of education. That's the same thing we're talking about with uh, people not knowing about the fractional reserve and how that works. Well, look, with regards to prostitution or homosexuality, we're not talking about children. We're talking about consenting adults. Uh, Robert Nozick, one of my favorite philosophers, talks about capitalist acts between consenting adults. So the you know, the people bring up, well, what about children? Well, children are a different issue. Children are uh, a very complex issue. We're talking about consenting adults. Uh, two men of uh, 45 years old go to bed with each other. I don't think they should be put in jail for that. I don't think anybody should be put in jail, but there should be other things that happen besides jail. I mean, I've I've written a book about that that I that I published this past August. It's a, a Christian view of prison abolition, specifically focusing on on, on the death penalty. Oh well, um, it doesn't have to be prison, but uh, these two men who are both forty five years old should they be punished in any way? Should violence be visited upon them for going to bed with each other? Absolutely not. Would be my view. Now, on the death penalty, uh, maybe I can convert you out of your heathenish ways. <laughs> uh, look, suppose I steal your car. What would be the just punishment for me stealing your car? Well, the first thing is I got to give the car back. At a minimum, yes. At the, and more should be done to me. But now I'm going to kill you. And what did I do? I took your life out of you. And thanks to Robert knows if we now have this machine, that if we put your dead body into the machine along with my live body, I'm the murderer, and we flip the switch, the life goes out of me and into you. Would we be justified in putting your dead body in the machine and my live body in the machine and flipping the switch and taking the life out of me and sticking it into you? Yes, because I stole your life, and the very first thing I should do is give it back. Just like I should give back the car that I stole from you, at the very least. And then, obviously, if I steal your car, I should be punished a little bit more severely than having to return the car. But the point is, if we had this machine, it would be very clear that the death penalty would be justified. Assuming that we know for sure and the, no question about, you know, the, the wrong uh, person is accused of murder. You know, let's stipulate, arguendo, that I am the murderer. Well, I deserve to be stuck into that machine kicking and screaming because I don't want to go in there because I know my life is going to go out of me and into you. Now, it's true we don't have that machine yet. Probably in 10,000 years, if we don't blow ourselves up by then, we'll have a machine that could do that. But we can envision the machine. And with the help of this machine, we can say that the death penalty is justified. No? I would agree. Ah, great. Okay. Uh, good. 
yeah, the the death penalty um, specifically for prison abolition. I think there's a lot of people, and we're getting a little short on time here. I'll let you go in about five minutes or so. Okay. Um, but the the idea of the death penalty, I think, is justified in in many many cases of people that are spending life in prison because the death penalty is not on the table, and they're there to continue mingling with other people in prison, and they're adversely affecting some people who will get out. And now those people have had to mingle with them and learn how they think and get to know them. And it just, you know, you can withdraw as much as you can, but you, there's really only so far you can get away from somebody when you're locked up with them. And I think it does a lot of adverse effects and causes a whole lot more death than if you were to just put to death the people who should be instead of causing the taxpayers to pay money to keep them alive for as long as they'll survive. Yeah, and you know, there is another issue, and that is that um, does the death penalty reduce the murder rate? And the answer is, paradoxically, paradoxically, the death penalty does not reduce the murder rate, but executions do. Because there are a lot of states that have the death penalty, but never execute anyone. Right. And and therefore, just having the death penalty on the books doesn't reduce the murder rate. Mm -hmm. But executions uh, focus the mind of would-be uh, murderers. And, and stops at least some of them. So if you have the death penalty, you're going to save other innocent victims of other murderers as, as well as doing justice. Exactly. Yeah. If there's any hope for somebody, you know, statistically speaking, somebody's going to be murdered in the United States tomorrow. If there's any hope for them to change their mind and not do it before they do it, um, there are some people that there is no, like their, their hands already in the air, you know. Um, but if there were... Uh, an opportunity to cause them to see this is what's going to happen to you if we catch you. If there's any chance at all that they're going to turn and not kill somebody, shouldn't we practice turning people around? What better way than making them aware this person died? Not they were executed in secret behind closed doors 30 years after they were caught. It was you go to trial, you're publicly executed, and, you know, um, not that I agree with how the Muslims will do it there'll be news of some public stoning or some public execution and it'll make worldwide headlines. And I think that that's supposed to be by design. The execution, funnily enough, is supposed to, like you said, paradoxic paradoxically, executions are designed to make execution unnecessary. Precisely. Yeah. Well, we veered away from fractional reserve banking, but I think we've covered a lot of uh, libertarian theory and I, I, I greatly enjoy being on your show always, and I hope you invite me back again in a couple of months. Yes, would love to. Uh, I don't know um, if there'd be anything in particular. I feel like we did kind of breeze over, but we might have to come back to it. We've got about four minutes left here. We oh, did okay. kind of we did kind of breeze over the the idea of like what what should you do? Like how do you how do you just strike up a conversation with somebody and say like, hey, what do you think about fractional reserve banking? Like you know. Hey, can I tell you about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? It seems kind of like a the only way to get into it would be a non sequitur. Well, I think what you do is um, you become a professor like I am and, and you uh, teach. Uh, or you do what you're doing and you interview people and you promote liberty in that way. Or you write a book or uh, you write a play or you write a movie. Or uh, one of my favorite cartoon is uh, South Park. Uh, on TV, which is done by libertarians, and and they probably get more people, a uh, hundred times more than you and I, but they, they have a talent that, that we don't have. Uh, Ayn Rand wrote a novel, a, a best-selling novel, to Promote Liberty. Uh, so there are many, many ways of uh, promoting liberty, and we each do what we enjoy. Uh, we should have fun. Uh, you know, you shouldn't uh, have to be a math teacher if you don't like math. Not that math is a good vehicle for promoting liberty, but let's say, um, I don't know, philosophy. Uh, you, you're just not into that. So, you know, you shouldn't um, you, you shouldn't have to do that. Uh, so I, I think the key is to have fun. Uh, and Otherwise, and, you'll never start. Yeah. And also the Libertarian Party is, is a great way to, to, to get the word out. And then there are groups like the Mises Institute or the Free State Project or the Cato Institute, Reason. There are, each state of the 50 states has a Libertarian State Institute. The one in my state is called the Pelican Institute. And they promote liberty more focused on Louisiana, but that's okay. Uh, and if each state does it, well, you know, 
uh, these are some of the ways of promoting liberty. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Block. I uh, appreciate you coming on and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. You take care of yourself.